All right, you're live. Good evening, everyone. This is McDowell Sonoran Preserve Commission. It's March 18th, and I am Chair Cynthia Winstrom. Uh, first order of business is the call to order, which we just did, and now the roll call. Uh, Chairperson Cynthia Winstrom is here. Vice Chair Lori Lapat Velasco is here, present. Commissioner Steve Coluccio. Coluccio is present. Commissioner Steve Dodd. Commissioner Dodd is present. And Commissioner Mark Hackbarth. Commissioner Hackbarth is present. Commissioner Lips. Commissioner Lips is present. And Commissioner Parker. Commissioner Parker is present. Welcome everybody. Uh, this evening, we do not have any public comment cards, so we're going to go right into the approval of the minutes, and we have two meetings to approve this evening. We'll start with February 18th. If everyone has reviewed that, are there any comments, uh, changes, or discussion? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to accept the Wednesday, February 18th, 2021 minutes as the draft presents them. Commissioner Lapat Blasco made a motion to accept the February 20th notes. Okay, the that was the motion was made by Vice Chair Palasco um, Lapat Palasco, and I'm looking for a second, please. Second, uh, Marshall Lips. Thank you so much, Commissioner Lips. Very good. We will go on to the minutes as presented to us here in the draft of March 4th. And if you'll review those, any comments, questions, or discussion, please. Excuse me, Chair. Yes. We need to take a vote on oh, that motion, I, please. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Commissioner Lips. I always miss that. So <laughs> let's vote on February 18th. Uh, Chair Winston votes yes. Vice Chair Lapaz votes yes. Okay, very good. And then to Commissioner Steve Coluccio. Commissioner Coluccio uh, votes yes. Thank you, Commissioner Dodd. Commissioner Dodd votes yes. Thank you, Commissioner Hackbarth. Commissioner Hackbarth votes yes. Commissioner Lips. Commissioner Lips votes yes. And Commissioner Parker, please. Commissioner Parker votes yes. Okay, the minutes are approved as voted. Now we will go on to the draft minutes of Wednesday, March the 4th. And any conversation changes additions to those minutes? Hearing none, I, I will- have, uh, yes. a request. Commissioner Hackbart. Request that the comment, uh, Commissioner Coluccio recommended changing to cultural resources being monitored was actually by me. Okay, and which number is that that you're looking at, please, Commissioner? Uh, and where uh, in I don't have it up right now. I'll have okay. to. Okay. Uh, this is Commissioner Coluccio, and that is approval of minutes number four. Got it. Okay. Great. I agree with Ms., uh, Commissioner Heckbarth. All right, that that should be changed to note Commissioner Hackbarth versus Commissioner Coluccio. Is that correct? Correct. Oh, okay. Thank you for bringing that forward. Any other changes, questions, or conversation? I do have a question, Commissioner Coluccio. Yes. Um, ahead, sure. if, you, if you look at uh, item number five, McDowell Sonoran Conservancy update, the very last. Uh, Sentence there or paragraph? I'm not sure if I understand what it's saying. The Conservancy is working with sta city staff on plans to create an interpretive trail around Brown's Ranch and on creating signage for Pima Dynamite. The Brown's Ranch part, I guess I'm confused about. Um, I thought we already had an interpretive trail there. Am I missing something? Uh, Commissioner Galicio, this is Scott. I believe what that's referring to is the planning and improvement of an interpretive trail at the actual ranch site of Brown's Ranch. Okay, 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 I got it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, to clarify that? Or, or is there a way to clarify that? Or? Uh, 
trying to think how best to say that. We could say uh, create an interpretive trail at the Browns Ranch site. That's better. That's better. And on created signage for Pima Dynamite. How does that sound, Commissioner Coluccio? That sounds fine. I'm better. Okay, great. Thank you for bringing that, that to our attention. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions for the um, March 4th meeting? All right. Hearing none, and uh, I will ask for a motion to accept with the changes as presented. Uh, a motion, please, to accept the minutes as changed. Vice Chair Lasso, a motion to accept the March 4th notes as changed. Okay, thank you. And a second, please. Commissioner Coluccio seconds. Thank you very much. And let's vote to approve that, those changes. Uh, Chairperson Winstrom, yes. Vice Chair Lori Lapat Palasco votes yes. Commissioner Coluccio. Commissioner Coluccio votes yes. Commissioner Dodd. Sure, Dodd. Was was that a yes, Commissioner Dodd? Uh, Commissioner Dodd votes yes. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hackbarth. Commissioner Hackbarth votes yes. Commissioner Lips. Commissioner Lips votes yes. And Commissioner Parker. Commissioner Parker votes yes. All right, thank you all very much. We will move on to our regular meeting. Let's lost the agenda on. Okay. Um, all right, we've approved the minutes. We're going to look at the existing ordinance prohibition of motorized vehicles, and Scott will be presenting to us about that. Thank you, Chair Wenstrom, commissioners. This uh, agenda item number five is a review of the existing ordinance. Uh, pro prohibiting uh, motorized vehicles in the preserve. And this presentation tonight is meant to be uh, kind of a higher level review of uh, the laws that are out there today. And then as we get towards the end of it, uh, we're gonna discuss some, some concept ideas that we've had uh, about how to shape uh, some program elements around the use of e-bikes as um, other power-driven mobility devices in the preserve. So starting at the beginning, uh, the use of e-bikes has been on the increase. For one, that the technology, particularly of the batteries used in e-bikes has been advancing. Uh, the, the number of bikes and different models that are available has been increasing. Uh, we think that the pandemic had something to do with the increase in e-bike usage, uh, it's, it's led to the increase of all types of usage in the preserve. Uh, there are various state, city, and federal laws that we'll talk briefly about tonight that relate to the use of e-bikes, not only in the preserve, but also in other parts of the cities on bike paths and sidewalks and things like that. So because of all of that, a clear understanding of definitions and regulations is going to be important for us moving forward. So for the Arizona state statutes regarding e-bikes, uh, many of you may be familiar that e-bikes are classified in three different classes. The class one are pedal assist bikes where the, the electric assist motor only kicks in while you're pedaling to assist the rider. Uh, they are limited to 20 miles an hour. The class two bikes are similar to the pedal assist, but uh, they have an actual button uh, that acts like a throttle. So you could use the motor while you're not pedaling. You can use it while you're pedaling, but also uh, just stand alone, but also capped at 20 miles an hour. And then the class three, uh, the main difference there is it takes it up to uh, 28 miles per hour. State law says that uh, electric bikes are not subject to title registration, vehicle tax, having a driver's license or insurance. Uh, in other words, they are not motor vehicles in the eyes of the DMV uh, requiring those types of things. The law does say that it grants the same rights and privileges of an e-bike rider to a person that's riding a bicycle, uh, that they would basically need to follow all the same laws and ordinances related to bicycles. It also includes that local agencies, such as the city of Scottsdale, can prohibit the use of e-bikes. So moving into the Scottsdale regulations uh, and ordinances regarding e-bikes, for outside the preserve, class one and two e-bikes are allowed on the multi-use paths and sidewalks. For example, uh, the path down through Indian Bend Wash 
you are legally allowed to use a class one or a two. Again, remember those are the bikes that uh, the motor uh, will not go higher than 20 miles an hour. Uh, the class three bikes are not allowed on multi-use paths or sidewalks. However, they are allowed in bike lanes and on the street. So for inside the preserve, there's a couple of ordinances. One is uh, chapter 21, which is the preserve ordinance in the Scottsdale Revised Code that no motorized vehicles are permitted in the preserve. And then there's Scottsdale Revised Code 17-86 that no person shall ride or operate an electric bike and these other types of devices that you see listed here in or upon any area that has posted signs expressly prohibiting that particular vehicle or device. So moving to a couple of photos of the preserve. Uh, I know many of you frequent these different areas, so you've likely seen these. Uh, this is our, our changeable message cabinet on Browns Ranch Road, just north of the Browns Ranch Trailhead as you're heading out into the preserve. And we have this, the red sign that you see here posted at all of the north area trailheads. Uh, and then it, it rotates through the south area. Uh, we, we don't post it continually in the south because th there's just not as much uh, bike riding in general that happens down there. Uh, one thing we noticed about the sign, this particular sign where it was placed, once somebody has pulled into the parking lot, unloaded their e-bike, uh, gotten ready to ride, now they're off and they're, they're heading into the preserve. By the time they would see this sign, uh, it was pretty hard to get them to turn around. Like at this point, they, they were out and going. And even if they saw the sign, uh, some of them were choosing to just continue on uh, into the preserve. So uh, a couple months ago, we added these more prominent sandwich board signs. This happens to be at the Granite Mountain Trailhead. Uh, but we have this sandwich board with that sign on it at all of the major access points, uh, all the major trailheads to the preserve, really to just get that point across to people that the, the electric bikes are prohibited in the preserve for the general public. Now, what this has generated, uh, we got a couple of compliments from people uh, that we put these signs up because uh, they didn't like seeing e-bikes out there. Uh, but it's also driven uh, several calls and emails and conversations with folks that are concerned about this sign, and particularly in relation to federal guidelines that under the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, regulations from the U.S. Department of Justice that requires state and local governments, again, with the city of Scottsdale, to be reasonably accommodating to the use of e-bikes as other power-driven mobility devices. Essentially what this federal regulation says is, uh, you know, not everybody with a mobility disability uses a wheelchair or a walker or more common things that, that you see. There can be other types of devices and if you dig into the federal law, there's lots of different types of devices listed. For us here in the preserve, it's mainly e-bikes that we're talking about. Uh, again, we need to be reasonably accommodating. We already allow bikes really from the federal law standpoint, how different is an e-bike from a regular bike? They both have handlebars, two wheels, they're roughly the same size. So it's, it's reasonable to accommodate an e-bike as an other power driven mobility device in the preserve. That acronym, the OPDMD, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue at first, uh, but as we've been uh, talking about this more and more, uh, that, that, that acronym will begin to kind of stick in your mind. The Department of Justice also, through their guidelines, encourages municipalities to develop written policies and rules regarding the use of OPDMDs. Again, it's a very broad category, but for us, we're talking specifically about uh, the e-bikes. So going forward, what we're interested in doing is exploring concepts to develop a pilot program to accommodate, you know, again, be reasonably accommodating to the use of e-bikes as OPDMDs, we would like to uh, put some ideas together that would bring clarity and structure to a program. Uh, we wanna be able to provide visible recognition that an e-bike is being used for a legitimate purpose. That particular bullet 
uh, kind of goes two ways from the angle of, uh, you know, our city staff or the conservancy stewards or the police. Uh, you know, if they see someone riding an e-bike, uh, it would be useful to see maybe a, a sticker or a placard or, or something that's recognizable that now you know that person that's using that bike is using it for a legitimate uh, ADA mobility purpose. It also goes the other way. We've talked to several people over the last few weeks uh, that you know, have disabilities and are entitled, you know, it's their right to be able to use an e-bike as an OPDMD, but they've told us in various different ways that they're not comfortable because you know, they may not necessarily look like they have a disability. So they're uncomfortable going out, even though they know they can ride their e-bike, uh, they're, they're concerned about people saying things to them or, or you know, scowling at them or, you know, uh, yelling at them that they're using their e-bike when they're, they're not supposed to be here. So being able to give that person, uh, you know, some sort of visible recognition that, that they have gone through a legitimate process and that this is a, a legitimate use of that e-bike. Um, we need to be accommodating to the needs of the users, you know, in a reasonable way. We also want to create a pilot program that creates ease of administration. We certainly don't want to burden our staff or burden the stewards or the police in a way that uh, creates unnecessary administration. Uh, we've been looking at several examples. Uh, one in particular, uh, the city of Boise has a trail system kind of similar to Scottsdale that ranges from greenbelt paths all the way out to trails that are out in the hills. Uh, and the, the basic idea behind Boise's program is you, you come to them, you claim your disability, they give you a sticker, it goes on your bike, uh, and then you're, you're now acknowledged and recognized as a legitimate e-bike user. So what our proposal is, is to dig a little more into those examples, uh, put together some uh, details of what a pilot program would look like for the 2021-22 season, uh, which is uh, would be it'll be coming up. Not that you know we're winding down this season, so the idea would be to put this together over the next couple of months uh, with additional commission in input, and then um, as we roll through the summer into the fall, roll that program out, and then in 2022, as the season winds down, we could circle back to the commission or, or any point along the way. Uh, and update the commissioners on how the program's going and uh, any tweaks or adjustments that we would want to make to it rolling forward into something that could potentially become more permanent. So that concludes the details that I had for tonight. We'd be happy to answer any questions or comments. Commissioners, questions or comments? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Parker, please. Thought I had a question. Um, what, did uh, Boise have any issues when they piloted or implemented their program? We do intend to follow up with them. We we spoke with them. Oh, Jesus, probably been, years ago. yeah, uh, probably a year or two ago when they were about a year or two into their program. So part of what we propose to do is circle back with them and find out, you know, how many. Uh, placards have they issued, if there's been any problems with it, not only on their administration, but on, you know, on, on the other end with the users out in the field. Um, so that's information that we can bring back here, you know, in one of the coming meetings, I don't know if we'd be ready for the very next meeting, maybe the one after that, uh, with additional details. One, this is Croy, one of the things that, um, you know, they did not have a huge number. There were I don't know if it was a couple dozen or a yeah. little more than that. Uh, obviously, we're a larger metropolitan area, so we might get uh, a little bit bigger number. But I know some people have asked, well, how many do we think? And we're really not sure. That's a little bit of the reason for proposing a pilot program. It gives us an opportunity to kind of explore that. Uh, you know, in the last couple months, we think we've received somewhere between a half dozen to a dozen questions specific to the ADA uh, accommodation aspect. And so we know there's some level of interest in, and uh, that's, that's where we think it'd be appropriate to have a, uh, a program that can manage that. Scott? Yes. Have we looked at any other the cities besides Boise that kind of has this program? Any we have. There's, we're gonna follow up on yeah, that? we'll follow up on that and include those details in our, our next presentation uh, in 
one of the coming meetings. I know Sacramento had a program. You know, some folks have just opened it up to any e-bike use, but others have you know kind of gone more of this route of actually you know creating these these registration programs. So we'll do a little more exploring on that, and that'll be part of what we bring back in the, the coming meeting. Okay, this is this is Chair Winston. I have a comment. I've I've thought about this so much. I've read a whole lot of stuff, and I did ask Scott to research this because of the number of e-bikes that we've seen in the preserve recently. So I've tried to come to terms with this really well and be as um, reasonable as possible. And with everything that you shared, the city of Scottsdale is reasonably allowing motorized vehicles or motorized OMP. That's it. <laughs> OPDMD. <laughs> OPDMD. <laughs> the city does allow motorized bicycles, et cetera. I mean, we're moving also into a motorized bike. Uh, we know that there's going to be a point in time where our cars would be motorized as well, but that's just for fodder. Nonetheless, we are accommodating those via those motorized items. And at the end of the day, the preserve ordinance still says no motorized vehicles. We have chosen to allow motorized wheelchairs. But as I look at this, I'm thinking, do we need to allow motorized bikes at all? I, I'm really questioning that. And, and are we just as good to go? Otherwise, do we go into the issue of motorized dirt bikes, motorized other things that come up? Mm -hmm. And um, I know that we've talked about that before as well. And it makes me wonder if we wouldn't be just as wise to say we allow motorized wheelchairs. That is our reasonable accommodation. The city of Scottsdale does allow motorized bicycles, et cetera, in these other areas. And what we talked about at the last meeting, I believe it was the last or the one before, was that we have to give our stewards tools to tell people, you cannot ride your bike here. However, you may ride it on these trails in the parks at the city of Scottsdale, or you may ride in the Tonto National Forest or whatever other resources we have that we don't necessarily need to allow e-bikes in the preserve at all. It states that in the ordinance. So I've kind of gone, tried to think through this, but I'm curious to hear comments. Do you have a comment from uh, a hand raised by Commissioner Parker? Oh, thank you. Commissioner Parker? Um, before I comment on that, I had a question for Scott regarding the, maybe the estimated increase since uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Well, across the board, we've seen about a 30 to 40% increase in total usage. That's everybody, you know, horses, bikes, mainly based off of the driveway counters at the trailheads. Uh, as far as the actual data on the increase of the e-bikes, we don't have an actual figure, but certainly anecdotally, you know, our staff have seen the increase. It, it's, it's curtailed since we put those more prominent signs up. And anecdotally, it's felt like there has been fewer since we put the more prominent signs up. Uh, but just based on the number that we were seeing and the number that stewards were reporting to us, uh, what our own staff were seeing out there, it, it was definitely on, a, on an upward trajectory that led us to feel like we needed to put up the more prominent signs before it, it grew too much. Thank you, Scott. And Cynthia, in response to um, your comment, my thoughts are that I guess as long as we're in compliance with the federal law, I don't know that for the city of Scottsdale for the preserve, even though our ordinance says no motorized vehicles that we can say we allow motorized wheelchairs and that's it. Someone may have a handicap, but not, or have a disability and not be in a wheelchair. So I think it gets really tricky as far as our ability to enforce the ordinance under federal law. And Ms. Croy, let me just step in here, and, and we're happy to bring uh, some of our legal uh, expertise uh, to the follow-up mm -hmm. meeting as well. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge really is in, uh, in looking at that and, and the logic that the ordinance says that uh, we won't have motors, but that we do provide reasonable, uh, either the motorized wheelchair, mm -hmm. was pretty much the technology known at the time when it was written. The issue of then the reasonable accommodation is that if we have an area, and yes, we do allow them elsewhere in the city, 
but the preserve is a unique space. And just as to come into any public building, we have to allow everyone to have reasonable accommodation, whether that's in terms of a sidewalk or the restrooms or an mm -hmm. elevator or things like that. We have to do that because if, if, norm, if, if folks able-bodied are able to get somewhere, you need to be able to reasonably accommodate people. And there, there are, in true wilderness areas and things like that, if, if it's only a very rugged trail and all it is is um, backpacking or hiking or things like that, and you're not allowing bikes, then you're not required to improve those trails to allow mountain bikes to allow someone on an e-bike to get there and not others that, and not allow others on a regular bike, uh, for instance. But because the, the preserve is set up to where we do allow hiking and equestrian and bike, just regular bikes, that reasonable accommodation then says, well, able-bodied folks on a bike are able to do that. The reasonable accommodation applies to Scott's point earlier in the presentation that once we allow the bikes, we're really not allowing everyone to bring an e-bike in, but we're uh, uh, identifying that a reasonable accommodation for an e-bike is essentially equivalent to a bicycle. And I'd much rather have the attorneys describe mm -hmm, that uh, better, but that's the, the fundamental. And Scott, yeah. I don't know if there's anything well, else you wanna to add to that. One other example to add, like I said in one of those earlier slides, OPDMDs can be all sorts of different right, devices. Right. In our instance, since we do a lot of bikes, we've kind of honed the OPDMD down to electric bikes. Um, but in, in other examples, other places, uh, you know, you could use a golf cart as an OPDMD or even an ATV. You know, there's all sorts of things that could qualify as an OPDMD. So say somebody came to us that wanted to use their golf cart as an OPDMD. We don't have anything remotely similar to a golf cart operating in the preserve. Uh, so be, again, being reasonable, mm -hmm. I think we could reasonably say to that, no, you can't use your golf cart as an OPDMD. But again, using the, the reasonable element, you know, a, an e-bike versus a regular bike is, you know, our, our feeling now is that it's reasonably similar. You know, they're, they're roughly the same dimensions and size and the way they operate, which is the fact that one has a, a and, system. And one of the things, it. I'm not sure we were clear about this, but the uh, some of the programs we've looked at, and um, Boise is an example, but some of the others are as well, uh, we don't have to allow all of them. And so typically what Boise has done is focus on class one and class two. So it's a limiting of speed and uh, one's the uh, pedal assist, one's the limited throttle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are things that will come back with recommendations as well uh, as far as you know, what flexibilities uh, we think from a legal standpoint we would have in being able to manage that. But we do believe we can clearly limit the, the class three um, mm -hmm. in that type of situation. And I think Boise has also restricted the trail. They have to be a flat trail, which, um, you know, it's not a mountain kind of trail. That be well, they, we'll they double check on where they yeah, are with that. Yeah, we can come back with more details. But one thing about their system is it's also, also multi-jurisdictional. Boise manages them, but some of the trails will leave Boise land and go across county land and then on BLM land and then back onto Boise land. So they do limit their ADA OPDMD <laughs> exception to trails that are 100% on Boise's land because that's what they have jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to, you know, cross jurisdictional boundaries into other people, you know, other agencies. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we don't have that problem because we're all city of Scottsdale, you know, they're all on the city's property. Mm -hmm. Um, but there can be some other considerations about safety and number of pedestrians on certain trails. So there, you know, again, it's, it's, there's some general guidelines that are out there that we can come back with more detail. Uh, but again, it's all based on that reasonable nature. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, one of the other things that we will be coming back with as far as, and I apologize, Scott, if you did mention this, I uh, didn't even forget for my age here. Um, but the uh, idea that uh, and, and again, going to providing clarity for all, uh, both users and uh, stewards and staff, um, making sure that our signage is really clear mm -hmm. about these things, making sure that we have the ability to direct people to this program if, if we did decide to have one, and also being able to offer people the alternatives, because clearly 
and speaking about other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. the Tonto National Forest, the County Regional uh, McDowell Mountain Park uh, do allow mm -hmm. uh, e-bikes. And so there are other opportunities uh, in the region. And for those that are uh, just looking to have an e-bike uh, without uh, the issue of uh, having a disability, we'd want to be able to assure or direct people to yes. where they can of recreate uh, in a legitimate fashion in that matter. So mm -hmm. that would be part of the whole comprehensive package that we would want to make sure that we're addressing mm -hmm. because it can be confusing and there's a lot confusing. of different variations within that. Right. So that would be part of what we would look to come back to you with based upon the direction from the group tonight. Okay. Comments, question, anything else from our commissioners? Two participants raised hands. Yeah. Commissioner Coluccio? Yes. I'd like to, I guess... Digress. <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. I'm, I'm going to digress because I have some basic uh, questions about the ordinance itself, if that's okay. Um, I, I'm, my first question is, uh, when was the restriction on motorized vehicles put into the ordinance? Do we know? From approximately? Well, it's, it's motors. Yeah, it's it's been in there from the beginning. And that was, it was crafted in 1999 and approved in 2000. Okay. And I would, I would clarify that there, there was a little bit before there was technically the uh, preserve ordinance. There were trails uh, as we were starting in the 90s. There were some restrictions on, and it was focused really on motorcycles, I, I recall, mm -hmm. um, that uh, a lot of this initial was motorcycles and kind of the quads and mm -hmm. things of that nature that were. I don't know that they were hugely impacting down there, but certainly up in the, the north of right. Granite Mountain area, there was a lot of activity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For so sure. Uh, yeah. So, so the, the next question I've got, so at, at some point in time, e-bikes, so the, the ordinance was initially really focused on gas-powered vehicles or gas-powered dirt bikes or whatever you want to call them. Um, at some point in time, e-bikes started becoming popular um, and that's probably been in the last five to seven years is when they started making their appearances. I mean, that for, for the most part, is that an accurate statement? I think from a standpoint of a more common retail, you'll probably find examples of whether some were gas powered uh, bicycles going back. I remember seeing some probably 20 years ago. Um, but I think from a more common standpoint, the advent of battery technology in the past five to seven years is, is where we're seeing a lot of this advancement. And uh, it's, uh, I think some of those early batteries might have only gotten you five miles or, or mm -hmm. something. Now uh, you can go a much greater distance. And I think that's where we're seeing uh, the, the, the growth in that. Yeah. I remember seeing a, uh, an old guy in the gooseneck with a bike that looked like he built it. And it was, it was, had a battery on it that, you know, was strapped on and it's pretty amazing. And that was probably four or five years ago. So, so at some point, did we make a conscious decision that e-bikes were to be included in this class of motorized vehicles? Um, how did, how did that come about? Or was it just assumed, you know, when they started appearing that that's what they were. And, and so they were prohibited. Yeah, and, and if we get our attorneys involved w w when we chat, there would there may be a desire to update the ordinance depending upon where we want to go with this. Um, but yes, when we first started seeing this, and I'm going to say this was probably five six years ago, um, the you know the just very general uh, language of of the ordinance says no motorized vehicles, and it doesn't say gas, it doesn't say electric, it simply mm -hmm. says motor. Mm -hmm. And so um, the preserve director, who would be me, uh, working with staff and others, uh, we, we felt it was simply in, in the intent. We did have discussions with the commission. I don't recall exactly which meetings and when, um, but we had some discussions about it. And we were very clear that our interpretation was that uh, a motor, be it gas or electric, was not allowed uh, by way of the intent and that that was our determination. But we knew back then you know, it was pretty early on that this issue of the ADA accommodation was there. And, and so that this is the part that, you know, with the advent of more of them, we, we think it's appropriate to talk about how, how best to educate 
um, uh, manage it through signage and manage it through whatever uh, appropriate mechanism for uh, uh, registration or whatever it might be. So, so other than, thank you, um, Croy. So other than the e-bike is a, is considered a motorized vehicle. Um, are there other reasons why we wouldn't want them to be in the preserve? In other words, so when I, when I run across an e-bike, when I'm out on patrol, um, you know, I'll, you know, pull the guy over and uh, not pull the guy over, but stop the, stop, hopefully stop the individual and not have him go whizzing past me. But if I have a chance to have a conversation, you know, I'll say, you know, I, I need to let you know that uh, that e-bike you have is considered to be a motorized vehicle. Motorized vehicles are not allowed here in the preserve. And, you know, sometimes the individual will then say, well, you know, why not? And well, it's a motorized vehicle and it's not allowed, and which is kind of a, you know, it gets to be a conversation that doesn't make a lot of sense, um, you know, at least to the visitor. So, you know, I'll typically say, you know, something like, well, you know, we, we think that they create more damage on the trails. Uh, and that's one reason. And, and secondly, you know, we talk about closing speed, that uh, e-bikes go a little faster. As a result, they might come up, come upon a, uh, a hiker or a horse, you know, a little quicker than a regular bike. And for that reason, you know, we're, you know, they're, they're not being allowed. But I'm not really sure that those, those responses are accurate um, or, you know, hold water to any great extent. So my question, you know, roundabout way is, is, are they banned because they're motorized vehicles or are there other reasons why we don't want them in the preserve? Well, I'll start and Scott may want to tag on uh, a couple of things here. I, I, I think fundamentally um, the, 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 the base answer is yes, they're motorized vehicles. And from the standpoint of uh, when the ordinance was first enacted, that was what was there. As the advent of them becoming more popular, we interpret them that way. As I said, we've had the discussion with previous commissions. Uh, I'll put that over the past five, six years. I, like I said, I don't recall exactly when we really had our first meeting on this. Um, and you know, there are clearly people on all sides of all those issues that you raised. They're very good questions, um, and you're you're going to find opinion ranging as to whether people you know, why they think one thing or the other. But, but to your, your core question, the ordinance says no motorized, they are motors. Um, and, you know, to the issue of uh, the, when the ordinance was enacted, it wasn't enacted because there were e-bikes out there. It was enacted because of uh, any variety of potential motorized access that might've been occurring. And I, I'd be quite I think honest in, in thinking that the majority of people were probably focused on motorcycles and quads and for that matter, people in Jeeps and other things. Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, you know, back in the day, as we were starting this grand uh, uh, challenge of uh, developing and acquiring a preserve, um, many of the roads out there that you know we use as trails today we're seeing four wheel drive activity on that. Sure. And so all of that, I think adds up to that where we're at, the direction we've received has been consistent to stay with this as no motorized. Um, and, you know, uh, again, we have the discussion of the ADA accommodation, but that's very similar to, you know, a, 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 a wheelchair as a motorized vehicle. And there are other things that people could come in on that, um, uh, such as a segue, uh, as an example, that would be a legitimate uh, alternative uh, method for people to come in. And as long as they uh, have the ADA accommodation, uh, we really can't stop them. Uh, and so that's, you know, and, but we don't have to accommodate making a trail work for a segue. So it get, it's a very delicate balance as we work through these things um, that uh, we need to think about. And I know, um, I don't know if you have more questions. I do just want to clarify that Commissioner Hackbarth has his hand raised yes, and nice. then Commissioner Dodd. Yes. I, I just had uh, one more question about ADA. And thank you for that, Troy. I do appreciate your response. Um, I, I see, I did a little bit of research and the definition of a disability 
um, according to ADA, is individual who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Is being old considered to be a, a disability? I, I'm not the medical expert, but I don't believe that alone uh, is going to qualify you. Uh, but you have another condition that uh, might might come into play. Darn it. Okay. So uh, really, my last question here is, um, you know, if we put together this, put into effect this pilot program, uh, and, um, you know, it's underway, if any stewards were to qualify because of a disability, um, are, are we going to want them to be out in the preserve wearing the blue shirt and the badge? Um, if they're riding an e-bike and have, you know, the legitimate, legitimate uh, permit to do so? Right. I, you know, have we, have we directly addressed that? Uh, no, but uh, again, back to an accommodation, if, if they meet the qualifications, and um, if that's part of doing a um, uh, patrol, patrol. Uh, just as a person, uh, any other steward on a bike, if it's the same process, um, it would probably be acceptable. But have, have, have we had that uh, specific discussion? No, but off the cuff, I would say, it, it, you know, and it's going to depend. I'm not trying to predetermine what a pilot might look like, but sure. along the lines of what we're talking about, uh, the Boise example or something, it's it's not uh, beyond my my thought process that that would be acceptable. Okay. All right. Well, I thank you for that. By the way, I was told I think just yesterday that Park City has a program uh, similar to this, but they apparently um, allow senior citizens be part of their permit uh, process. So just an FYI, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I was told that by a third party. Thank you for letting me take this time. Thank you, Commissioner Coluccio. Commissioner Hackbarth, please. Yeah, I wanna make a couple of comments here. Uh, first off, the idea that a, an electric bike is equivalent to a pedal bike, I think is a false. Uh, there's just no way most people are going to get up to a 20 mile an hour speed and maintain it while pedaling. Uh, secondly, the issue of safety on some of these trails that are fairly narrow and yet bicycles could be on them, which would mean an electric bike would be, and you don't have enough space as is, and you have pedestrians stepping off the trail. I think that's an accommodation you know, for bicyclists, but having a motorized bike coming up on top of you, not a good idea. And also for the amount of people that are in some of these trails, again, high speed, um, not a good idea to mix with a lot of people. And so if you are going to have this uh, exception, I think there has to be limited trails available to them. Um, and I would not even prefer that, partly because even though they're quiet, they still generate noise. And that is one of the reasons the preserve has been established is to keep that sense of remoteness, quiet, and uh, just isolation. And I think uh, electric vehicles are not a good fit. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hackbarth. Commissioner Dodd? Um, yes, I, I think perhaps it's time we revisit why we don't want motorized vehicles in, in the preserve. Is it because of the speed they attain? Is it because of uh, environmental issues, uh, noise, uh, pollution? whatever. Uh, is it a speed issue? Is it safety? I, I think if we better define why we don't want electric, don't want motorized vehicles, we can better address people's questions and, and comments and answers. We have some answers. This is why we don't want 
motorized vehicles in the preserve. Thank you, and, Steve. Thank you very much. Any other questions about this topic? Um, what, what I'd just like to clarify is what, what we would propose is to bring something back. And I don't know, it certainly won't be in two weeks, whether it's four weeks or six weeks or whatever, but we will, you know, based on this discussion and very good discussion, Absolutely. It, it's exactly yes. what we need to yes. have. Um, we'd like to do the additional research. We'd like to maybe outline a framework of an option of a pilot program um, and bring that back. And there's, I don't want anyone to feel that we're forcing that, but we we do believe it's appropriate, uh, both from a legal standpoint and, and the, the level of interest and bring that back for a discussion in the not too distant future, but somewhere in the, I'd probably put it in the four, six, eight weeks, uh, we'd be back with that. I think that sounds good. I really appreciate everyone's um, candid comments and concerns and, and valid uh, points on, on all sides. And the, the conversation is very appreciated. We tend to not have as much conversation when we're not face-to-face. -face. So thank you all for that. Great. Commissioner Pat Velasco. Yeah, I think it's really important that we understand the legal aspect. Of it. I, I think that is going to drive a lot of this discussion. And if we don't have a good handle on that, we could be designing a program that's going to be taken to court. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I Well, I think that is important. That's, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. I think we need to look at that carefully. We also need to understand that the preserve is created to preserve. That's the number one reason. The number two is passive recreation. Always has been, always will be. So we can't lose sight of that. And to Steve's point, really line iteming, or I'm sorry, perhaps that was uh, Commissioner Hackbarth, uh, line iteming why we don't want bikes in here. Is it the noise? Is it the speed? It's a danger. Uh, to his point, you can't always hear them and now they're coming up behind you faster than a, a person driven bicycle. All those things I think should be line item what we look at in four to six weeks. Right. I know we have a, a hand raised by yes. Commissioner Lips. Thank you, Commissioner Lips. Hi, this is Commissioner Lips. Um, first of all, I almost got ran over by one <laughs> the last time I was over by Pima Dynamite. Um, and, you know, one of the things I noticed about the bike, which we all identified after it went Zoom past us, um, was that it was an electric bike. But on top of that, I don't know how the stewards are going to be trained to differentiate because the technology has changed so much, even in the last year or two on these bikes. You know, now you can barely tell that they're electric bikes. You know, I, I just feel like if they get allowed in, it's gonna be a Pandora's box. And I, and I see both sides of it. I mean, I know Steve wants one really bad, <laughs> you know, and I mean, it, it makes sense that the older you get, the more you want an e-bike. But I, I just really worry that once this, once you open the door, it, it's going to be like opening the floodgate, and you know, and it's going to put a lot of pressure on the stewards as far as trying to police all of that. And um, just my two cents. Thank you, Commissioner Lips. Again, really appreciate everybody's comments. And, and that's certainly something yeah. part of what we can look at with some of the research as, as far as uh, checking in with some of these organizations or uh, communities that uh, have been managing it for some period of time. Uh, and I mean, the, all fair questions mm -hmm. and the ability to bring those back. I don't know, Scott, if there's anything else you wanted to uh, touch yeah. on, but I, I think, uh, again, we appreciate the, uh, it really helps to have feedback. Doesn't matter which side or what right. what angle of the issue, right. uh, but that this helps us in how we can do some of the research. And we will absolutely, uh, I can assure you, we will have uh, the attorney's office here with us um, and uh, be able to address that because we it is a serious issue. Some of you may have dealt with this. We were faced with some uh, ADA compliance issues five six years ago uh, because of our step gates. 
and uh, the fact that step gates wouldn't allow somebody in a wheelchair or other uh, method of getting in. And so we, we actually had the Department of Justice uh, knocking on our door. So uh, there are uh, realities to this. Sure, that, uh, and I don't mean it to be in a threatening manner. Right. Uh, when you really get down to the core of it, it's about allowing people to have access to the preserve. And you know some of these issues, and we'll talk about um, the realities and perceptions you know, we have problems. We have a lot of complaints from just bicyclists because they're not being polite, because they're not talking to people, because they're going too fast. And whether that's 20 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, five miles an hour can be too fast if you haven't told somebody. So I'm not trying to pick sides, right. but I, I, we do need to make sure that's all in context. That uh, And that's where we have long struggled or endeavored to educate our users. And that's one of the key goals at Pima Dynamite with the upcoming trailhead improvements is we really want to redouble our efforts on the, I'll, I'll just say the bicycle community, but all users about sharing the trail because we know it's a popular area already and it will be more so with a full trailhead opening and restrooms and, and water. And those are things that we, as a collective, all users have to really work at. And we hope to develop or can continue to grow a culture that the preserve is a place to recreate responsibly and not to be out racing, and whether you're running, whether you're equestrian, uh, trotting or galloping, or whether you're a bicyclist going quickly, uh, anybody can be offensive to others if they're not communicating appropriately. So. Thank you for wrapping that for us, Croy. Um, with that, again, thank you for everyone's communication. And we're going to move on to number six policy process update. We're going to start with Croy. Very good. Thank you. Um, so following up uh, at the last meeting, um, and, uh, we talked through some updates to things we put together over a year ago. Uh, and this is just our summary slide. I've retitled it with the, uh, the new headings that we talked about last time. Um, and this next slide uh, shows what we presented at that meeting. I'm not going to dwell on this one. Rather, I'm going to roll to the next slide, which we sent out to everyone. And this is linked for those uh, listening online. Uh, the agenda uh, on this item 6A, you can click on it and this graphic will come up for you so you can follow along. Uh, and I'm not going to make everybody read this smaller print because um, I'm sure on smaller screens, it's pretty darn small. Uh, we'll go to this next slide that identifies kind of the upper half of this. Made no changes since the last meeting based upon what input I got back. Um, I think, uh, and, if, and if there are any comments tonight, I'm happy to take them and do amendments, but we kept this part uh, as is uh, the lower half of the page. Uh, the next slide here. Um, I did, I, I believe it was uh, Commissioner Coluccio, you, you'd uh, brought up that in my editing, I had dropped the perpetual funding. So I reintroduced that here at the bottom of the page under the comprehensive funding and uh, work that in. Hopefully uh, it'll take any comments uh, on that. And then the other thing, and I do have the next slide, but I don't want to jump to it just yet, but I did update the process timeline. Uh, so we're working towards uh, that effort. So this, again, are those the, the key seven topics and then the, the, the discussion of comprehensive funding and how will we go about uh, pursuing a perpetual funding source or mechanism uh, to kind of cover base costs. So this really was intended to, are you comfortable with this? This is what we're going to work forward with. Uh, Scott and I met with some of our folks that help us uh, with web pages and communication, and uh, they're ready to start uh, developing a web page based on this. And we'll have the ability on all seven of these items to be able to click on one and go into more detail. Uh, I'd start with just a probably a one paragraph description of each one. And then from there, as we get into the cost discussion and other things, We'll have it in a, uh, a form of a uh, spreadsheet ability to dig down into details and get more funding. So um, we're gonna be looking for, do you have any comments on this? And then the next slide uh, jumps to taking that page. So kind of the, the, the stuff on the left side of the screen is what you just saw. 
And then the stuff with a little bit of the gray tone is the cost projections uh, for the next 30 years. And uh, looking at that, and, and again, going back to we're looking to assure uh, protecting the preserve of some form or fashion for the next 25, 30 years. Um, and so I'm not going to go through each one of these today, but all those red ones that have the TBD or to be determined, that's going to be our collective homework assignment over the next few weeks and months <laughs> is to fill in uh, those things. And the goal will be that staff will come to you with some of those, and we're going to do one tonight, uh, and we'll we'll put a number out there, but we can do it in a range. We can do it uh, with feedback. We may have the number, but there may be some aspects of that number that we don't think is appropriate to be included in this type of funding mechanism. So it's going to be iter iterative. We're going to be uh, just like our previous discussion of, about motorized vehicles. We're going to be interested in your feedback because ultimately we're going to take this to the council. Mm -hmm. And if we are looking for a long-term funding mechanism, we're going to take it to the voters. And I, I think we would all agree that the more we all bet the heck out of it and beat it up and make sure that you believe in it, that we uh, as staff think it's accurate um, and that the public will find it believable will lead to the greatest chance of success uh, for a long-term program. So um, this is a little bit of the outline uh, that we have and you'll probably get really sick of seeing this spreadsheet. <laughs> Uh, and it'll probably end up looking better by the time our, our staff get it into a web page format or something. But um, this is just Croy. This this is what rolls around in my head, and unfortunately, yeah, <coughs> the, the way I do that. The the not applicables are just things for uh, take land acquisition priorities. I don't see those to buy land as a yearly. I look at it as a one time cost. So we'll identify if we want to acquire. Uh, some portion of the remaining 3,600 acres uh, in the recommended study boundary, whatever that is, we multiply it by a value, we'll come up with the number and that would be under the one-time cost. Whereas some other things such as the daily preserve operations and maintenance are really a yearly cost. And any of these would be going through the idea and, and we'll have to evolve this over time is what's the process of managing and reviewing this? The, the general thought has been that the commission would be a logical yearly touchstone to uh, recommend to the council in the budget process. And so whatever we come up with as numbers uh, at this point, you'll uh, the idea would be that if the voters support it and approve it, that the commission would have uh, a review uh, and recommendation mm -hmm. phase every year that would lead to the, lead to the council uh, budget process and something of that nature. So, and again, a lot of room for variation and, and updating of that, uh, but that's that's a little bit of what we are about to embark on and getting into more detail here. Great. The next slide I have, then this is the, the process. Uh, I updated it with all the new titles. Uh, so we have uh, the next three or four months, we'll be working on vetting these out more and putting some numbers into it. The goal would be to get to the council in a work study format, probably late summer, early fall would be my guess. Uh, a little bit hopeful here that we might have the ability to have meetings in person at some point. Uh, I don't want to get too uh, optimistic, but uh, <laughs> I, I think that's coming. And I think that will lead to a more interactive dialogue and the ability to maybe get better feedback. And with whatever feedback we get from the council, the commission can then revise that in the fall, winter, and be ready to have a recommendation to the council by a year from now, so about this time. And that could lead to a target of a tentative vote. The earliest one we could do would be the fall of 22. The next option would be the fall of 24. So I've set it up on the tentative of 22. It can always slide uh, to the next cycle. Uh, but I started with that just give us that as uh, the time frame. So that's our update on timeline. And this is just a re really a reiteration of what I just went through here. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions on that piece of it. And then Scott's gonna walk us through um, uh, a refresher on the, uh, the, the uh, maintenance and operations. But I'm happy to take any questions on what I just uh, walked you all through on the, the policy elements and the, the cost spreadsheet. Commissioners, any questions? All right. 
Uh, yes, Commissioner Coluccio. Yes, uh, thank you. I think the policy uh, items look great, uh, the way that you've laid them out and organized them, I really do. And I, I do, Croy, really appreciate uh, your adding that perpetual funding comment back in there at the bottom. Thank you very much uh, for, for taking my input and acting, acting upon it. Is that an oversight? You know, I think, <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, um, it, it was, I always figured it would be that, but what we actually title it may be, may evolve as we get into the politics of it, but having it as a goal Can't is perfectly fine. Yeah. And so I think I, I, I think that's probably why I edited it out as I was going through it. But um, sometimes I, I don't think I accidentally did it. I do think I kind of was going through and said, oh, we can, we can pick that up later it was probably more of it. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for adding it back in. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, we're going to move on to Scott's presentation. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Wenstrom, Commissioners. As Croy mentioned, uh, one of the specific items we want to dig into a little bit more tonight is uh, the maintenance and operation costs that were one of those line items that we just saw in the spreadsheet. Uh, so just reviewing uh, briefly our 2020-21 fiscal year budget for the maintenance and operations uh, for the preserve. Uh, there's really three main categories that we focus on. One is the direct costs, which includes our uh, personnel, as well as contractual services. That's basically the, the city paying other people to do stuff for us, whether it's printing our maps, maintaining our trails, hauling our water, things like that. Uh, and then commodities, obviously that's the stuff uh, that we purchase, uh, trash bags and mutt mitts and tools and uh, other operating supplies. And then the administration and facilities, this is our, um, the utilities, you know, we have to pay the, the water and electric bills at all the trailheads, uh, obviously our custodial services, other types of maintenance that occur on our facilities, uh, you know, fixing things that get broken, um, uh, a lot of it's plumbing related issues, uh, as well as our community services administration. Uh, there's a lot that happens here in the community services department that's not encapsulated entirely in our preserve personnel budget, but um, you know our, our secretaries and other staff that, that assist us in the administration of the preserve. And then there's the indirect costs. Uh, that has a lot to do with our, um, you know, the, the, the people in the purchasing department that help us with purchasing. Uh, we've talked a bit tonight about, uh, you know, the legal services that we get from the attorney's office, uh, things like that. So for 2020-21, the total of all of that comes in just over $800,000. So moving into these next slides, we're going to actually jump back a little bit in history, back to fiscal year 18-19. And the budget we had then was 750,000. And then the actual uh, from that same fiscal year came in at 737,000, which is about 1.7% under budget. Then for 1920, you'll notice that the total of the budget increased uh, to 973,000. This was uh, with the addition of the Pima, I'm sorry, the Freesfield and Granite Mountain trailheads. Then the actual came in just a little over 900, which is about six and a half percent under budget. Uh, the main reason we came in under in fiscal year 1920 was the second half of that fiscal year was the first half of 2020. And I think most of us remember what started happening uh, around about that time with uh, the onset of COVID-19 uh, and scaling back uh, due to the uncertainty of the economy. Uh, we scaled back really across the, the entire city uh, in our spending. So then here's the 2020-21 the budget, which was the slide we had just looked at, uh, at the 811,000. Uh, so it had been scaled back because of COVID primarily. And then looking forward to 21-22, this is the budget that's going through the review process right now with the city council. They will ultimately culminate in May and June for uh, council approval with then beginning um, July 1 of 2021. Uh, we have added some things back in. 
uh, some additional staff and resources, primarily to support the oncoming opening of the Pima Dynamite Trailhead. And then going forward from there, we just included the next two years of 22-23 and 23-24, and those uh, projections for the budget increase on a two point, excuse me, 2.4% uh, annual increase, which is a figure that is being used by uh, the city's financial folks uh, across the board for all of our budget projections going forward. So the intent of this really is to, to give you an idea of kind of where we've been, where we are now, uh, where we're looking at going in the future. And again, uh, the purpose tonight is to look at these numbers and ultimately lead us to what dollar amount or range of dollar amount do we want to include in the spreadsheet that Croy had covered just a minute ago. And with that, I'll, I'd be happy to answer any questions on specifics of the budget. Uh, and I'll pitch it back to Croy uh, for the overall policy process spreadsheet. And again, we're open to, and as we did in the fall, this is very similar to uh, what we presented back in September, October, November. We had questions about, we can drill into any detail uh, that you want. And our goal will be that some level of that detail is uh, open to the public to, on, and this spreadsheet to be able to click on this. And so as an example, this is not to say it's the final number or that anyone that's agreeing to, but take this and we roll this forward and you'll see under uh, item two, uh, under the yearly costs, uh, we, I just put in $900,000 based on that range we were talking about. So the idea would be that as we get this into a web page format, that someone could click on that and pull up some of that information that Scott was just presenting. And whether that's the commission, whether that's the public at large, um, we'd have that ability to go into that. We're happy to do presentations on any level of detail, whether it's uh, cleaning of toilets or whatever it may be. Uh, we, we get it that these are big numbers uh, in some ways, but when you look at how many restrooms we have and uh, cleaning them this time of year, two times a day, uh, there's a lot going on. And um, so the, there's a reason for these costs and whether we agree that that number should be 900,000, something less. So we, you know, as you think about this and I don't need answers tonight, but do you feel more comfortable with having it as a range for the current time period? We could put 800,000 to a million or something like that just for the purposes of the discussion. And Scott and I debated, well, which way we should show it. I said, we're just gonna put a number up and we'll, right. we'll get feedback right. and see what you all uh, feel comfortable with. So Corey, when we take this- Commissioner Lepat, oh, it's Commissioner Lepat class that is asking a question to Corey. Um, I think the public would be interested in knowing, you know, how many people visit the preserve every year. And this is, you know, how, how many, you know, it's a buck per person. I mean, if that, if they could, if you could kind of give it, get it down yeah. to their level, I think that that's something Great. people can relate to. And, I, right. and there's Very so right. many people who, I, I think you really, I think the public, Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a very good comment. Uh, so as we're going through this, um, and we've got um, Aaron Walsh and Ann Porter who will be uh, helping us with the public uh, process and the ideas of how we communicate this and probably maybe de-technicalizing some of our language at times so that uh, everybody that doesn't deal with it day to day or month to month or whatever uh, can look at it and understand what we're trying to get at. So that, it, but as you see things like that, that, that say, hey, how do we relate this to the number of users or things like that? Mm -hmm. That's, all of that is great. That's the type of thing we need to throw in it because if that helps the public at large mm -hmm. as they're looking at this and knowing that they don't delve into these numbers day to day, okay. uh, and if there's ways, I mean, that's part of what drives me is how do we tell this story? Right without making them spend hours and hours and hours, but can they look at it, spend 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever their limit is, five minutes, um, and you know, help them out so that they have a sense of that and be as transparent as we can be. I think to your point, Lori, the, the opportunity to say, these are the number of visitors, and that's easy for people to see that ratio, $1 per person, $1.25, whatever it is, right? And so that's, a, We've got a hand raised here by Commissioner Coluccio. Oh, thank you. Um, can Scott, can you go back to the city cost slide? That one right there. 
Um, I guess my first question is, would it be possible to see this slide with those subcategories built in? Absolutely. Yeah, certainly. So, and I know you went through a discussion on, you know, on all that. And I don't, certainly don't want to revisit that, but I'd be curious okay. just to kind of see how each of those continue on. The, uh, yeah, oops, oops. And so, yeah. So, so that slide with this information in it. Yeah. But the, the second, if we can go back to that, that slide, um, I thought I was looking at the 21-22 budget. Um, are 21. Though it looks like, do we have an error in the summary, the total there? I the math, there's something not yeah. adding up, right? right. We'll, we'll, we'll double check that and we'll bring that back. Okay, yeah, thank there's you. There's something that's missing. Uh, and that may have gotten lost. And as we transferred tables, sometimes mm -hmm. we might have lost something there. Looks like we got very efficient in 2021. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's in the, the personnel cost number got carried forward from the previous one. So um, we'll, I think that, that 421 is, is probably uh, where it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll double check that and bring that back. Good catch, Steve. And that's a little, you. the challenge we have right now is this stuff is we're, we're when we get it into the spreadsheet right. to where it's there. It'll be a lot easier to reference it. Sometimes I do this uh, transfer stuff into a PowerPoint, and it doesn't always right. transfer right. Correct. So we'll uh, clean that up. Thank you. Any other questions for Scott on this segment? Scott, let's just roll forward a couple. I had one last slide. So th this is the one that did the nine hundred thousand, and then very simply, uh, this is uh, starting to anticipate our next meeting. And the idea will be, we'll come back to you with presentations in two weeks on the wildland fire mitigation and the cultural master plan. Mm -hmm. And you can see I highlighted the TBDs there. So the goal is we're gonna start um, bringing you more numbers. And again, uh, we can go to whatever level of detail um, and we'll also be able to talk about whether we like it in a range. You know, we may have some of them, a range is better and some of them we may go with a hard number. And like I said, I, I want you all, in my, in my way of thinking, this is the homework assignment we're all gonna share, but I want you all to feel very comfortable that it represents the, and I know there's seven of you and may not always agree exactly, but um, I want you all to feel very comfortable that this represents uh, the, the commission's uh, recommendation as we go forward. Thank you, Troy. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Parker. Um, Croy and um, Croy, I had a question for you. I think that we've had a couple of updates from the city treasurer on the future general, future general fund projections. How will that play into your spreadsheet here? Uh, another, you guys are right on target here. And I've been speaking with uh, Gina uh, Kirkland, who is uh, our director on, on the uh, preserved numbers. And um, uh, I would anticipate we would probably bring that back uh, late April or early May with an update. Um, part of that is as the, as the budget process is rolling forward, um, the city updates every year our projections for the tax uh, generation on a five-year basis. And so this is we're probably just a hair early, but in another two to four weeks, I think we'll have the budget release it may be faster than I'm thinking here, but with that, we'll be able to update those numbers and come back to you. And so uh, Commissioner Parker, then as we start filling in all these numbers and see what that's at, we'll then also know, well, what's really available left in the existing tax. And that existing tax is really only for land improvements and uh, trailhead or trail improvements or improvements. So uh, land purchases or improvements. It's not for maintenance. It's not for some of the uh, other elements that might be listed here. So that's where this discussion about how do we go forward with a possible vote in 2022, what would we be asking for? So that would be, we will be bringing that forward in the not too distant future to run parallel with what the cost projection might be and how might we fund it. Very good. Commissioner Parker, was that helpful? 
Yes, thank you, Croy. You, you are welcome. <laughs> All right. On to item number seven, Scott. Thank you, Chair Wenstrom, Commissioners. First, I have just a quick uh, verbal uh, update on uh, last week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and we were planning on Friday, but it rained, so we moved the date till Sunday. Uh, but uh, the Conservancy had some Pathfinders back on duty at the Browns Ranch Trailhead. We set it up uh, really just as a test. You know, we know that we're still uh, you know, in the pandemic, hopefully towards the, the latter part of it, but with more people being vaccinated and folks feeling a little more comfortable uh, being out uh, in front of the public, we put together in close coordination with uh, Jackie Casey from the Conservancy, as well as Barbara Montgomery and Rory Cassidy, uh, the leadership of the, the Pathfinders and uh, many different Pathfinders that came out to help uh, they basically did uh, two different shifts on Wednesday and two different shifts on Thursday and then again on Sunday uh, just to, to, to be out and kind of almost dip our toe in the water and see how the public reacted, how the, the Pathfinders felt. And uh, we put up plexiglass around the, the Pathfinder cart. Uh, we put some cones out to keep people six feet back and uh, some signage that we're here to help you, but please respect us and, and stay socially distanced. The initial report, and we can bring more detail because uh, we're going to kind of try out a little more testing and uh, expand potentially down to Lost Dog over the next couple of weeks, um, just to, to kind of see what, what the feeling is out there. And from the three days that the Pathfinders have done already, uh, the comments that came back were really good. There were no red flags. The Pathfinders generally felt that the public was being very respectful. They were very appreciative. And um, you know, we certainly thank the Pathfinders for their continued commitment and involvement. So uh, we'll continue to keep you updated on that. And then just real quickly, I wanted to show you a few photographs from uh, just the other day of the Pima and Dynamite Trailhead. Uh, it's coming along. I know it kind of looks like a mess with all the dirt and caution tape, but what we're seeing here is, is incredible progress. This is looking north through kind of from the, the parking lot to my back looking through the breezeway. Uh, that's the restroom building that's on the right-hand side and the office on the left. Uh, kind, kind of similar layout. You'll recognize it looks a little bit like uh, the Browns Ranch Trailhead. Flipping around the other way, now I'm looking south. So the preserves to my back, looking south through the breezeway. And as we've talked about uh, numerous times with the commission and a lot of the work that the Pathfinders, I'm sorry, that the, the Conservancy stewards, Pathfinders and patrollers and lots of different uh, stewards helping develop the signage program, uh, particularly for the different trails that are gonna head out from here. So I know my, my crude drawing here will kind of give you a little bit of an indication that big green area in the middle, there's gonna be a landscape island in the center of this area. Uh, but the concept that we've talked about handfuls of times now about dispersing people, those different seat walls that you're now seeing on the left and right uh, are kind of at the start of the different trails, the, the uh, Axle Grease Trail, the Hawk Nest Trail, the Latigo Trail. Um, so we're really starting to see the area take shape uh, and, it, and it's uh, pretty exciting to see it coming along. Just a couple other shots. Uh, they're, they're obviously putting up the, all that steel that you see. Those are the, the steel studs of the walls. This is kind of on the east side of the building and what's gonna be our, our little uh, kind of storage area and shop where we can park a vehicle, keep all the tools and different resources that we need. There's the uh, south wall of the restroom building. This is at the northwest corner, looking kind of to the southeast across the site, across the building. Uh, right there where you see the lift and the roof that kind of juts out to the north, this is what will become the Art Decabooter Amphitheater. Out in the parking lot, uh, they're, they're starting to install the wheel stops. You can see that, that pipe there. Uh, that is what will be a wheel stop bumper. They elevate them in this fashion. You can see this uh, footer that's underneath mm -hmm. is going to get filled with concrete and become the ribbon curb and the foundation for the <clears> wheel stops. And you can see the as it heads on down, this will basically be the, the uh, portion of the parking lot. So it's real exciting to see things coming along. We're still looking at um, July for a soft opening. And that's all I had. I'd be happy to answer any questions 
on any of those items. Any questions for Scott on item number seven? All right, hearing none, we will move on to number eight, upcoming meeting dates, locations, and agenda items by Croy. And we already hinted at uh, this a little bit in uh, previous presentation for the first uh, uh, key items that we're looking to bring back will be a uh, discussion of some of the costs associated uh, with uh, wildland fire and the cultural master plan. Um, and I know Commissioner Hackbarth, we still uh, have not been able to track down a date uh, for an update on the county flood control district, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, just uh, got ourselves a little busy here in the last two weeks and we'll, uh, we'll track that down. That's all I've got, unless there's questions. Questions for Croy? All right, hearing none, we will move on to uh, number nine, which is commissioner comments. Anything else that you would like to add for this evening for the good of the commission? Commissioner Coluccio. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, for item number six, we talked about a possible homework assignment. Are we going to get additional communication on that, Croy? Yeah, I'm not sure how much will happen in the next two weeks. Um, at, we're going to draft up some of those, um, the, the points that I was talking about, the click downs um, mm -hmm. as paragraphs. And if uh, uh, Scott and I get our homework done, we'll get it out to you to <laughs> have some sure. homework to do on top of that. Uh, and certainly, I'm not sure I'm going to have a lot of those numbers out far in advance, although cultural master plan might be pretty quick. We might have that one out. I know I've got a lot of uh, math work to do on the wildland fire stuff, but if I get that ready, um, we'll have that. We also may have a bit of a presentation from uh, both preserve staff and uh, Scottsdale Fire at that meeting, but I'm not sure uh, how much detail we'll be prepared to get into at that or maybe a meeting or two down the road, uh, but we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, so, so unless we hear something, uh, you know, we're, we're, we don't have anything to do, at least on that particular issue. I'll be sure to advise you of what and when your homework assignments are and when they're due. Okie doke. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments for this evening? All right. Hearing none, I will entertain um, a motion to adjourn. Item number 10. I'd like to make a motion. This is Coluccio. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All right. And a second, please. This is Commissioner Lips. I'll, I would second that motion. Thank you very much. With that, and again, thank you for your comments. We have concluded this. Yeah, I got to take a vote. Thank you. Gosh, darn it. Okay. A vote. Okay. So, Chair Winston votes yes. Vice Chair. Commissioner Alaska votes yes. All right. And then on to Commissioner Coluccio. Coluccio votes yes. Commissioner Dodd. Commissioner Dodd votes yes. Commissioner Hackbarth. Commissioner Hackbarth. You're still muted, Commissioner. I don't know if you heard that, but I voted yes. It's Commissioner Hackbarth. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Commissioner Lips. Commissioner Lips votes yes. And Commissioner Parker. Commissioner Parker votes yes. Thank you all very much. Looks like it's about um, 1823. All right, we are adjourned.